Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Diodo, Diodo Oliveira. Uh, I joined the high school here at FSU last, last fall, so I'm very new here. And I would like to discuss, talk a little bit about this topic, which is not a very recent topic. It's not a very recent research or uh, techniques, application of techniques. However, it's, it is still uh, not very widely applied. People don't, don't use it that much. And I believe that, that we'll be able to see why that happens. Okay? Because it's a very, uh, at the same time, it's a very technical uh, topic, but at the same time, it requires you some uh, social skills, uh, regulation knowledge, and th therefore it's very broad. It demands a lot of study, a, lo a lot of reading, and uh, it gets to a point where applying these techniques, techniques get very complex. Okay, so the, the reason I decided to present this topic is because business need these kind of people, okay? and they are not there. So it's uh, an, an opportunity for you guys and uh, I believe that it's a very interesting topic at least in my opinion. I like to, to do this. Uh, I like to study this, this kind of this type of topic and like I said it's there is an opportunity there if you guys want to uh, take a better look at it. Okay. So, the, the title that I got there is Techniques and Tools to Properly Apply Digital Forensics in Enterprise serv Service and Services. But we can abstract as digital forensics, okay? And first, I would like to introduce to you guys what digital forensics is about. And then we can go deeper and look into how to actually perform those te tasks, what techniques should be used, and pay attention to regulations, okay? So just very briefly, I'd like to give you my background, okay? So like I said uh, earlier, I joined FSU last fall. Before that, I did my bachelor's in Brazil. I'm Brazilian, so I did my bachelor's and my master's in Brazil, and I finished my PhD from the University of South Florida last spring, 2018, okay? And my experience, like I also mentioned to you guys earlier before we, we started the, the presentation, I have worked in industry and academia, okay? My industry experience goes back to uh, 2003 and my uh, academic experience, I've been a faculty member for, for the past 12 years, okay? Uh, mostly in Brazil and then when I came to the US to study at USF, I was a teaching assistant and research assistant at USF and now here at FSU. And during my ex my uh, industry experience, I had some a few opportunities to apply digital for forensics, okay, to uh, uh, act as a uh, digital forensics inspector. And I want to share with you guys some situations that I've been through throughout these years. Okay, my research focus, we can summarize this by infrastructure, network infrastructure, and cybersecurity, okay? So those are some topics that I've been uh, studying throughout the years, okay? Cyber, cyber security, cyber infrastructure, cyber physical systems, uh, IoT, network function virtualization, software defined networking, okay? And network services and management and digital forensics. Okay, and that is why I decided to pick this topic, 
that is something that I study, and in my opinion, it's very interesting, and I hope I can I can uh, uh, drag your attention to this topic. Okay. Now, the first thing that we need to understand here, that we need to see, is what is computer or digital forensics. Actually, computer forensics is just uh, one part, just part of digital forensics, okay? However, most of the digital forensics is uh, related to computer forensics, and that's what we're focusing on here today, okay? We're focusing on computer forensics, not mobile, mobile uh, not uh, internet in general, okay? But computer forensics local forensics, local digital forensics, okay? So, what is computer forensics? Use of techniques to preserve, identify, extract, and interpret digital data, okay? And it, we're going to discuss that more, but it is very important to understand that you have those four different steps, okay? And you have to follow those four different steps, okay? Analyze evidence, documentation, I don't know about you guys, but personally, since I come from, uh, uh, I have an engineering background, documentation is something that I personally, I hate, okay? <laughs> Most technical guys don't like documentation, right? And I am a very technical person. And, however, this is fully necessary when it comes to digital forensics. And why is that? Because of the, uh, the country regulations, okay? And I come from Brazil, and Brazil is much more restrict when it comes to regulation, much more than the US, okay? So, learning this, adapting myself to this was very tricky, was very hard, okay? So like I said before, you have to merge your technical skills to regulation and social skills, okay? And finally, identify the source. Ultimately, that's your final goal, right? Identify the source. I mean, you want to be able to say, okay, this server, for example, has been hacked. That's very important. But not only that, if you want to use that information in court, you must be able to say, to state who hacked the system, who got that privileged access, and that person was not allowed to. So, if you are able to identify uh, what happened, that's just halfway through. Okay. If you want to get to the final point, to your final destination, you must be able to say, okay, it has been hacked, this is what happened, and that is the person, part of the group, that actually did it, okay? And these two very famous guys here, Dan Farmer and Vitsi Venema, um, they, uh, they came up with this, this statement. Gathering and analyzing data in a manner as free from distortion or bias as possible to reconstruct data or what has happened in the past on a system. Now, please pay attention to this. As free from distortion or bias as possible. If you want to use whatever you discover, if you want to use that information in court, you must guarantee that all techniques that you use did not distort, did not change the uh, uh, original information from that server, okay? And that is the challenge. Actually, that is all that computer forensics is about, okay? Make sure that you don't change the state of that machine, if it's a machine, if it's a server, okay? That's what you have to make sure. Okay, so, First thing that we have to think about here is why uh, implement computer forensics? Why do this kind of inspection? 
while trying to find out what happened and who did it. Okay? And why it happens. So a wide range of cyber crimes we have today, right? They can be enterprise cyber crimes or non-enterprise. Of course, we have some that are both applied to both enterprise and non-enterprise. Okay, so for example, non-enterprise fraud, espionage, extortion, espionage, for example, can be applied to both, right? Such as extortion, intellectual property. Malware, dissemination, homicide, pornography. Okay, I would say that when it comes to non-enterprise, these two here, the, these three there, are the most common ones, right? Uh, malware dissemination. I believe that if not everybody here, most of us had a malware installed in in our computer at some point, right? That is very common to see, uh, and it, it's very possible that some of those malwares were installed by our, our, ourselves we, we were just not aware that was a malware okay? um, for example, many softwares that we install nowadays we install the software and there is it also installs a, a, another software that is running in the background it's collecting data from, from, for example, about what your uh, the, the types of websites you're visiting, uh, the types of products that you're purchasing online, and that information is being sent to some companies, and they use that kind of information to send you uh, some marketing uh, emails, for example. So, all, all of the sudden, you start receiving emails about, oh, Let's say that you just purchased a PlayStation, okay, or a game, and now you start receiving emails, oh, from, let's say, from GameStop. That's quite a coincidence. No, that's not a coincidence, okay? Probably there is a spyware installed on your machine that is tracking all your movements, okay? And they start using that information to sell products, okay? So, I'm not saying that all malware is actually trying to steal money from your bank account. No, that's not it. But you have some malwares that they are just leveraging information from your type of medicines. Okay? Enterprise, intellectual property theft, theft unauthorized, unauthorized activity, sexual harassment, software piracy, okay? And also, there is uh, something that is very common, but people don't talk about, okay? And let me see, I think it's the next slide here, yes. It's from, this movie is from 2003, so it's old for most of you guys. <laughs> It's not old for me, and I really enjoyed this movie. Has anybody here watched it? Yeah. Well, if you like Hollywood movies, I would tell you to, to watch it. I know, it's old, but you're going to dig it. You're going to like it, okay? And in this movie, there is a colleague of yours, and he's doing a, he is also a PhD student, and he's doing a research on uh, what, it, what is called uh, ghost IT or shadow IT and shadow IT is about okay most companies allow employees to bring their uh, external hard drives flash drives from their homes their personal stuff they can bring their their personal stuff to the company use it and go home right in this movie you see that uh, CIA does not allow that to happen. So CIA agents, CIA employees, they cannot bring any kind of storage device from the outside, mm -hmm. okay? And why is that? Because it may seem to very strict, but it's very important to guarantee that all the information that is being uh, transmitted inside does not leave 
the premises. Okay? So, you can <coughs> see that happening in this movie. Okay? That is another type of uh, cybercrime that people don't talk about. Okay? And most companies allow that to happen. Okay? And if something happens, you can apply computer forensics to figure out, for example, that type of information, that doc file, for example, which was a top secret file, has left the premises. Someone made a copy and took it to the outside world. Who did it? That is your ultimate goal. Figure out who did that. Now, more about cyber crimes. And um, this is uh, I, I, uh, this is uh, an estimation of how much money people that are committing cyber crimes are going to make until 2021. That's 1.5. I'm talking about T as in trillion, trillion dollars in revenue, 1.5 trillion dollars. I can't even imagine how much money that is, okay, but that's the money, right? And you can see, of course, that's just an estimation, but uh, uh, if I should have put the, uh, the URL, the link here, but I, I can send it to, to you guys if you want later on. And the, the author, the person that is, was just one person that made the, came up with this estimation uses some very reasonable uh, arguments to, to come up with this, this number, right? Another set of numbers that we have here, okay, that's the, the, from the Department of Justice. How much money uh, monetary damage has been caused throughout the years, starting from 2001 and uh, up to 2016, okay? Um, of course, we, we have other two years there. No, we don't have 2019 yet, but we have 2017 and 2018. But you can just get a glimpse of uh, how much money that is. And that's in million dollars, which means here, we're in the billion range. Okay? That's how much money has been lost to cyber crimes. Okay? 1.3 billion in only in 2016. Okay, now, on the other side, let's say that you decide to become a computer forensics investigator. Okay? You like to watch CSI, NCIS, those stuff, and you dig it. It's like, oh man, I want to do that. Okay? This is what you need. Okay? And it's, it's not that hard, right? It's not that hard. Uh, talking about requirements, at least. So you need a bachelor's degree in uh, any uh, IT-related, technology-related uh, uh, undergrad, okay? And you can also include criminal justice into that, okay? You need some experience there, one to four years. And this is from 2016 as well, okay? Uh, the annual salary range, that's about $68,000, $70,000 a year. It has increased a little bit uh, up to now. I would say, but that's just my guessing, I would say it's about $75,000, okay? Uh, you may need NK certification or a similar certification, most companies, uh, most states, they require that kind of certification. If you want to use your uh, investigation techniques and your, your investigation results in court, okay? Some states may also require a PI license, right? Which is, in my opinion, that's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> and some key skills. So this is what I mentioned earlier, right? That is the biggest challenge. You have to be able to merge your 
humane, let's say, your humane skills with technical skills and regulations knowledge, right? That 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 is kind of broad. That, that, actually, that is very broad, uh, very broad requirement, right? Interview, investigation, communication, problem solving skills, patience, honesty, right? Uh, ability to apply techniques for computer forensics and regulation knowledge. And this is, like I said, this is country dependent. So that regulation knowledge will depend on where you are, right? So just to give you an example, here in the US, as long as you have, for example, an NK certification, you're good to go, most things, right? So you can apply digital forensics, your, your techniques and skills, and you can use your results in court. If you go to a country, let's say Brazil, that's far from enough, okay? First of all, you have to be a government employee. You have to be a government employee. If you are not, whatever you do, a government employee must be sitting right next to you, monitoring everything, every step. Okay, so you have to adapt to whatever you're doing. And it's very common to have situations where you're going to apply digital forensics inspection that involves not only the country you, you live in, but it involves other countries. Guess what? You have to understand the regulations in your country and in that other or other countries. Okay. Now, steps, like I mentioned at the beginning, four steps that you need uh, to f follow to apply computer forensics, okay? Data acquisition, identification, evaluation, and presentation, okay? Data acquisition, you have to follow a few steps that we're going to talk about, more detailed steps, when it comes to data acquisition. First of all, you have to gather all data that is available. All data that is available. You're not capable at this point to identify what is anomaly, what is attack, what is just random or uh, valid data. Okay? You can't tell the, the, the difference yet. So you have to collect everything that you have available. Identification, data that can be retrieved. So now you have to be able to tell apart, okay, this is ordinary data, this is suspicious, okay? Once you can tell what is suspicious, then you can identify valid evidence. I mean, out of all that suspicious data, what is actually Anomaly, what is actually information that I can use to identify what has happened and who's, who's done it, okay? And then, finally, you write the report. This is what happened according to my investigation, okay? And point out to someone if possible. Challenges that you have there. Rapid action, okay? Back up all data without disturbing it. Once again, this is the most important thing, okay? Don't change the original information. Don't, don't change the original data, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about how to do so. How can you guarantee that you're not modifying uh, the original source? Guarantee integrity of the evidence and tools reliability. You have to be very picky on which tools you're going to use. Okay, you have to search for tools that are reliable. There is a bunch of stuff, just like any other type of software, right? There is there are the ones that you can rely on. There are the ones that are like, you know. Okay, now, out of those four steps, 
for, to apply computer forensics, you have the evidence processing uh, steps. Okay? First, shut down the computer. That's the first thing. Shut down the computer. And look, when I say shut down the computer, I'm not saying about, I'm not saying click on the Windows uh, button, shut down, shut down. No. It's like hard shut down. Yeah. Pull the plug. Huh. Yeah. You pull the plug. Okay? Why is that? If you do a properly a proper shutdown, start, shut down, shut down. You are changing the information. You are changing the behavior of that operating system. You are changing the hard drive. You are changing the RAM. You are changing a bunch of stuff. If you do that, nothing that you do from there on is valid in court. It's just that simple. Okay? Why? Because you cannot guarantee that you didn't touch the original information, source of information. Actually, you can guarantee that, guarantee that you did change it. Okay? Because that's how it works. When you properly shut down, you're changing a lot of information both in the hard drive and in the uh, RAM, in the memory thing. Now, look, if I just pull the plug, shut down pulling the plug, what happens to the information that I had in my RAM? The RAM is volatile, right? It's going to be wiped out. You're going to lose that information that you have in the RAM, right? So before you actually shut it down, the only thing that you're going to do is one single, simple command or use a simple tool to dump all the information that you have in the RAM to a file, an external file, for example, copy to an external hard drive. That's the only thing that you can do before uh, shutting down, hard shutting down the machine. Okay. Done. Uh, why is that? Prevents remote access to machine instruction of evidence. That's another very important thing. Okay. Document the hardware configuration of the system. Right? Again, documentation, documentation, documentation. Not, there, not everything about the computer configuration prior to relocating. So you have to make sure that each and every step that you take you are writing down what you're doing, what is the type of hardware, what is the type of software that is being used. Document everything that you have. Step three, transport the computer system to a secure location. Okay? You're going to do a very thorough and very um, risky set of tasks, steps. You have to bring that machine to a secure location. You have to guarantee that there, there is nobody else that could uh, impact on your study or even try to change your, uh, your inspection. Okay? Make bit stream backups of hard disks and floppy disks. Again, anything that you do, make sure you don't change the original source of information. Let's say that you have a Windows server, okay, your Windows machine. If you use the cursor, if you use the mouse, to copy files from one folder to another one, you just hit Ctrl C, Ctrl V. You are changing the status of your hard of that hard drive. Okay? So there are tools to offline copy bit by bit data from one storage device to another one. And look what I just said, offline copy. You are not using that hard drive in a machine. So when you shut down a machine, this is what you have to do. You have to inspect the hard drive from that machine, right? You're going to shut down the machine, you're going to remove that hard drive, you're going to install it as a secondary hard drive in another machine. 
Because when you boot that second that machine that you're gonna use to do the inspection, it's not changing the original hard drive information. Okay, it's booting in that machine's hard drive, and the suspicious hard drive is just a secondary hard drive. So that's why you say it's a offline inspection. Okay. Mathematically authenticate data. A CRC checksum. Uh, before you start working on that hard drive and after you work on that hard drive, you have to perform a checksum before and after, and then compare the checksum. If at any point you change the status of that hard drive, the hard drive you're inspecting, the checksum is not is not going to match after you do the inspection. So guess what? If you're doing the inspection, you, you work on that hard drive for let's say two full days, three full days, and then you perform the checksum, compare before and after, they don't match. You just lost not only two, three days, but you just lost any capability that you had to use that information in court. Okay. must be able to prove that you did not alter any of the evidence. Document the system date and time. Make a list of key search words. What kind of... Uh, because when you're starting an investigation, you will have some feelings, some suspicious. Okay, I think according to what I can see here, the behavior of my machine seems like the attacker may have done this, that, or that. So you can come up with a list of search words, key search words, to try to find what uh, he or she did. Right? Evaluate the Windows soft file or Linux soft file. That's a temporary, it's like a RAM, a random memory, but it's stored in the hard drive. Evaluate file slack. And a hard drive is full of file slacks. Okay? When you save a file, when you store a file, usually that file is not going to fully use these blocks. It's going to use partial blocks. And then you have some slacks. Guess what these guys do when they have a system? They hide information on file slacks. Okay? So you can use tools to search for file slacks, uh, hidden information in file slacks. Okay? The same thing for unallocated space, deleted files. Do you know that when you delete a file, you didn't actually delete it? Right? The file is still there. It's just not addressed anymore. Okay. And why is that important? Because when someone hacks into a system, the first thing that guy is going to do is try to erase all track that may lead to him or her. Right? You can try to find those tracks. Search files, file slides, and allocated space. Document file names, dates and times, documentation, documentation. Identify file program storage anomalies, evaluate program functionality, document your findings, retain copies of software used. Like I said before, you have to use reliable softwares, okay? Because you have to retain copies of those softwares. So in court, once again, in court, you're going to present all the evidence that you were able to put together, okay? You also have to say, this evidence is reliable because these are the softwares, these are the resources that I used to come up to, my, uh, to this conclusion, okay? So, 16 steps, very detailed ones, okay? 
So once again, uh, the types of uh, uh, inspections that you may use or may perform. Hard drive, okay? Very important. Understand file systems. So as you can see, you need some very, very deep technical knowledge, right? Understand file systems. Drive cannot be active, like I mentioned, offline, okay? Techniques, compare timestamps. If you simply open a file, you don't change it, but you access a file, just open it. There is going to be a timestamp stamp change, okay? You can tell whenever someone has opened a file. You didn't change it, but just access the file. And you can, well, during the inspection, you can use that information, okay? Check file type. Search for dirty words or hidden files. Now, let me tell you about an experience that I had. Back in 2010, I got to the place that I uh, used to work for, and there, were, there was a note on my keyboard, on top of my keyboard, from my boss. Don't turn on your computer. Wait for me to arrive. We're going to inspect your machine because it's been hacked. And I'm like, okay. So my boss arrives, we sit down and we do all that. We remove the hard drive, uh, we plug in as an offline hard drive, make, it, make a copy of it, a, a bit by bit copy of it. And then we start inspecting what's going on. Well, how could he tell that my machine had been hacked? Because the traffic load in that workplace had uh, a pattern, okay? At some point, that traffic load had a spike, like a spike, you know, like, uh, like five times more traffic than usual. And he started to uh, narrow that traffic, then he came to the conclusion most of that traffic was coming from my machine. Good. Now, how can we start inspecting? How can we find out what's going on? What is that machine actually doing? doing? Okay. That's the first step. Find the source. So, we knew that in the background, Without my knowledge, that machine was performing a specific test. Let's try to find that out. The first thing is, if it's performing a test, there is a test being executed, right? There is a process that is being executed in the background. It's just like if you're, if you're a Windows user, you hit Ctrl, uh, Alt, delete, and you open the task manager. It shows you the processes that is being executed in that machine, right? It shows all processes. Okay, but it was not a Windows machine. It was a Linux machine, but that doesn't matter. I list the processes and I see no suspicious process, process being executed. All processes in my process list seem to be legit, but obviously it's not, but obviously it's not. What does that tell me? I have two options. One, the attacker managed to hide that process, or the process is there, I just can't see that as a suspicious process. That was the case. What did the attacker do? He looked for a process that was a legit process to be executed in my machine. And he changed it. So it was doing whatever that process was supposed to do. Okay? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was my uh, mail 
agent software, which was running all the time in the background, okay, to check if I had new email. If I had a new email, it would tell. So he just left it there and made the change, made the modification. At the same time, this process is going to spam. It's going to uh, spam emails wherever. Okay. What did I do? Uh, check file type. Okay. I started to check all processes that I had and then I was able to tell, okay, this process here had been changed. How could I figure that out? Timestamps. That process had been changed like three, four hours ago. Okay. So we were able to identify the source. We were able to identify what it was, what it was doing. We were not able to identify who did it. Okay. Because here we have another trick that these guys use to make our life a lot harder. They use proxy servers in countries such as Afghanistan, countries that don't have political uh, partnership with uh, Western countries. Okay. So that is another challenge. right? Another technique that they use, steganography. And this is a very young technique, right? Uh, I can't state if that's true, but people say that has been used by the 9-11 attackers to transfer the, the, uh, the blueprints from the, uh, the aircrafts they were going to, uh, to use in that attack. So when they were exchanging emails about their plans and uh, what they were going to do, they, uh, they've hidden data into regular files such as image, audio, video files. Okay? So NSA couldn't track that down. Well, nowadays they can't. Back in the day they couldn't, right? So what is this technography? You use regular files, video files, uh, text files, image files to uh, hide other information between, uh, uh, behind that image, for example. Okay. There are softwares to implement steganalysis, which is try to identify if there is information hidden in those type of, type of files. Another more, let's say, raw type of steganography. Use network data, network transmission to hide information. All protocols, okay, all protocols headers have, have uh, um, some header fields, right? And some protocols, they have header fields that are not usually used. Okay. They can be used, but most of the time they are not. So, here for example, okay, we have some fields that they can be used, but usually they are not. Type of service, identification, flags, fragment offset, that's the IP. Okay. So they use options plus pad. This is usually this is fully empty. Okay. So they hide information in these um, fields, in these header fields, okay? Thankfully, there are some tools to help you identify those kind of sources, resources. Inspect the RAM, right? There are some tools that may help you inspect the RAM. So the idea is Look, whenever an access happens, the attacker 
may try to wipe out all his traps from the hard drive. Okay? But there is always traps in the RAM. So therefore, you have to inspect the RAM as well. But that may be a little bit tricky because the information that is in the RAM is not stored as a file that you can just open. Okay? So finding information in the RAM is a lot trickier than finding information in a file, okay? in a storage file. Therefore, you have to perform some raw search. And once again, you have to understand uh, uh, understand sectors, understand uh, block, understand assembly language. Okay, that is, the, in my opinion, that's the biggest challenge. Malware. <coughs> Execute a set of instructions and techniques that you can use to figure out what a malware is doing is use reverse engineering. It requires deep assembly level understanding. Okay? Has anyone here have ever ever had the chance to see an assembly code? No? Not yet? Okay, so there's an example right there. Yeah. Okay. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? <laughs> This is, in my opinion, this is the most complex thing that you may face when it comes to uh, computer science. In my opinion, right? My personal opinion. I really hate assembly language. However, if you're willing to become a computer forensics inspector, you have to uh, at least understand how it works. You don't have to actually be able to read all these instructions, but you have to understand how it works. Okay. Now, a good thing here is, let's say that you suspect that a specific file or a specific software is a malware. How do you figure out if that is whether that is in fact a malware or not? You have to analyze its behavior when, once you execute that software. There are some tools that may help you with that. Okay? These tools, they take snapshots. So here's what you can do to figure out if a specific software is a malware or not. That's the software. That's the executable file, the exe file. Okay? You open that tool for example, OliDBG, that's one tool. You open OliDBG, you say, take snapshot. It starts analyzing the system. You execute the software that you believe to be a malware. Execute. Go back to OliDBG. Stop. Check. What is it going to do? It takes a snapshot before you execute the software and after you execute it. And then it shows you. These are the instructions, the assembly instructions that were executed by that software. And you can track it down. For example, here you have an example. Oh, so that software is executing that file, it's cleaning that memory space, it's loading a DLL, a library file, okay? So from there, you can see, oh, so these are the steps. And then you may be able to tell, okay, this is, uh, that's a, a malware. It, it's not supposed to do what it's doing. Or no, that's just a regular software. It's doing whatever it's supposed to do. Okay. So, here are just a list of tools. I mentioned some of them, uh, but here are a list of tools that uh, you can use to help you out when performing uh, 
digital forensics inspection. Okay, listed by the type of analysis that you're performing. High drive analysis. You have to use uh, some. Well, you don't have to use, but you can use some Linux distributions, some live CD distributions. Never use uh, an end-user oriented operating system to perform these kind of tasks. You have to be specific. So what I mean is, if you're performing uh, a computer forensics inspection, you have to use an operating system that is uh, looks towards computer forensics inspection. Windows is not that type of operating system. Okay? So you have to use the proper tools, the proper softwares. It's a little kit that's uh, uh, actually a set of softwares, or a set of command line softwares that will inspect your hard drive, checking for timestamps, uh, file slacks, uh, file modifications, file changes, okay. Tripwire, that's another one, and then rootkit scanners, okay. It's going to search for installed rootkits. Maybe you are not aware of it. There is a backdoor installed in your machine. That type of software can help you out. You have state analysis softwares, that's one example. When it comes to temporary memory inspection, RAM inspection, that's a tricky part because basically you cannot use a graphical tool to help you out. You have to use command line uh, tools to do that search, which means it requires a, a very deep uh, understanding on your part. And to inspect, search for malwares, those are two examples. Okay? So, like I said, the idea here was to show you this area, okay, to show you how computer forensics and computer forensics inspection works. Uh, show you that you have to be very detailed, very thorough, okay, and always be concerned about regulation. Document everything that you do, okay? Be very thorough. Uh, use regulations on your side, okay? So, no regulation and follow those requirements and document everything that you do so that when you get to if you go to court, if you're going to use that in court, you can just go there and say, okay, everything that I did, I did by the book, okay? This is what I had to do, this is what I did. And the most important thing is, keep the source original. Make sure you don't change the source, okay? And like I said, it's uh, a field that requires professionals, and people are not going for it, okay? Because as you can see, it's very technical, but at the same time, it requires knowledge from other areas, such as law, and you must have some social skills, okay? But in my opinion, it, it's fun, okay? So yeah, that's what I wanted to show you guys. Questions? If um, um, is it fair to say that the um, the amount of given the amount of information that exists online that these processes are occurring all the time and uh, like I mean like uh, like malware and uh, hacking etc and then that you you guys come in at the point where there is a red flag mm -hmm. right. Yes. I'm, okay, because I I, I, I'm, I don't know anything about the field, and I'm not into computer science, so I'm just like a regular user. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, you're right, you're right. To actually start doing it, there must be a red flag, there must be a sign. That it, it, this is awkward. There's something going on here, 
and we don't know what it is, but we're, we, we suspect that there is something going on. And that, that's a tricky part because if you suspect that there is something going on, even though you're not sure, you have to follow all of these procedures, right? Because if you're like, okay, I'm just kind of suspecting that there is something, but I'm not sure. So just check, let's see if there is something going on. And if it is, if you say, okay, there is something go going on, then we go for a deep inspection. That doesn't work. If you suspect, you have to follow all the, those steps from the beginning. You may tamper the information. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, exactly. The, and the question, if I, because a red flag for me, because I'm not knowledgeable, would be like, oh, okay, my bank account went to zero. <laughs> right. There you go. That's like that's my red flag. Yeah. But I assume that for you, it would be maybe a few steps before. <laughs> 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 Somebody just took something out of my bag. That's it. That would be a good place to start. Yeah. No, you're right. Well, uh, so uh, the usually the, the red red flag comes from the end user, right? Oh, no kidding. Yeah, usually it does. <laughs> yeah, because you see, the uh, first of all, most companies they don't have an employee in their company with this kind of skills. Okay, oh. they don't. Oh, so right. usually these are freelancers. So you gotta call them in. Wow. You gotta yeah, call so them in. Like a, yeah. Like a so, the red flag comes in for you, end user, and then the company calls the freelancer inspector. Okay? Which means at this point, something very serious has already happened. Your, your money's in Afghanistan now. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So uh, the, the thing is, there are some, that's what is interesting about cybersecurity, in my opinion. It's very broad, and people are not aware of it. People think that uh, cybersecurity is like, okay, you use a tool, you use a software that is going to guarantee that nothing happens. There is no such thing. So the first thing that you need, that a company needs to do is hire a professional that is capable of implementing the best solutions to mitigate or try to avoid these kind of occurrences. But still, that might happen. Even then. Yeah. Even then. If it happens, there is another guy, which is the, the investigator, the freelancer, that is going to come in. Probably the uh, network security engineer from the company doesn't have the skills to do this. Right. So, you actually, a company needs a set of security engineers to perform many different tasks. And at the point of, say, a malware that's tracking, like, I know there's a malware that would change your uh, search engine. So, if I have my computer on Google uh -huh. as a default, then suddenly I come in and it's Yahoo. And you'd be like, oh. And then you start searching and then they're tracking what you're searching. But would that be something that, is something that you can argue as like an invasion of invasion privacy or? It depends. Uh, that you have two situations. Yeah. One that is the most common is a pop-up window come up, you don't read it, you just click yes. Okay. Which means we install the software that belongs to Yahoo, for example, and while you're installing that software, it asks you, could we make... So you agree. You agree. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's uh -huh. the most common thing. Another one is the software that we're installing does it without asking for your permission. That is a malware right there. And it's very common. It's very but common. then even then, since you install it, you know, but you, you're agreeing you install well? the software, yeah. but the software should have asked you if it could make that change. And in change. that case, you would have a case? You would, absolutely, yeah. It's changing your computer behavior without your knowledge and your uh, permission. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Any other questions? No. Maybe. So, um, 
sometimes we also have to uh, it, figure out there are like both sides of things. For example, when we, when we are talking about security, it might have impact on the, what is it, the privacy aspect. So uh, regarding the library, we have like RDM, uh, I mean, uh, uh, DRM, right? digital rights management and everything. So what do you think of the future might be, whether it should be like concerned to the privacy or So uh, I think it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a very tricky area because on one hand you have humans, human rights, on the other hand you have the goal of keeping, keeping data secure and keeping people safe, right? And it gets to a point, for example, NSA. Uh, I, I believe that most of you are aware that anything that we transit, that we transmit uh, through internet is being analyzed by NSA. And, and it's not conspiracy, that's, that's just a fact, right? They have systems that inspect all data that you're, you're transmitting uh, through the internet. Well, why are they doing it? So you can see it as they're doing it to search to avoid 911, or they're doing it to gather information about people and use it for politics. So it's very hard to tell, but let's assume that uh, they're doing what is right. They're using that information, that private information, but to guarantee our safety, right? If that's the case, I'm in favor. Well, and that's just my personal opinion. I'm okay with NSA, the government, reading, analyzing uh, a love letter that I sent to my wife, if that's supposed to guarantee that my kids are safe. You know? But that's just my personal opinion. People, most people, most, and I feel like, I may be wrong, but I feel like most Americans, they're more, uh, they're very uh, concerned about their privacy rights, right? So, like I said, it's very personal. Maybe it's because I'm from Brazil and in Brazil, we're not that concerned about our privacy rights. It's something local. So that's what I think. As long as they are using that information, and I'm assuming that's the case, they're using that information to guarantee our safety and my kids' safety, I'm perfectly fine with it. Yeah, I'm going to go with the might lead to breaches of that, uh, you know, data, right? So, so you can't control that everybody that comes in contact with the data is going to have that honesty. Yeah, I agree. And that's where you kind of like, it's hard it, it, to Like I said, it, it's tricky, it's, it's tricky. tricky. So, assuming that they are doing it for the right thing, I'm in favor. How can we tell if they are actually doing it only to guarantee our safety? You yeah. cannot. So yeah, it's it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it, everybody? Thank you so much. Thank you very much.